we'll just read and then go back. Second Peter chapter 3 says, this, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose, and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Yes. Let us pray. Father God, we just come before you, Lord, and we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that um, there is your day is coming. Lord, as your word says, Lord, that we're not going to be left here. We don't, this is not our hope. Lord, this is not our home. Lord, we are passing through. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you've made. For us to be a part of this new world, this new heaven, this new earth. Lord, without you, we would be lost. Lord, we would be damned to hell, Lord. But um, because of your mercy and because of your grace and because of your love for us, Lord, you sacrificed it all. So, Lord, we could never repay you for that, Lord. Let your word go out. Let it wash us, Lord. Let it remind us. Let it stir us up. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, the book of Peter, we're just going to do a quick recap. Second Peter is a farewell speech to the churches in Asia Minor, and it's mainly to the Jews, and this was prior to his death. Peter knew that he was about to die, so this is his farewell letter. He was martyred upside down by the um, Emperor Nero, and the reason he was martyred upside down, he didn't feel like he was worthy enough to be martyred like Jesus Christ. You know, that's how much he honored his Lord. So he writes this letter to protect and to warn them of false teachers. You know, Pastor John went through it last week with um, chapter 2. Just with the false teachers, there was a lot of different um, ideologies that were coming out at that time. And they were denying the validity of the scriptures. They were denying Christ's second coming. And they were undermining the faith of those believers at the time. One word comes to mind when I think of Second Peter's is to remember. It's a reminder. 
Second Peter's one and twelve, he says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them, and are firmly established in the truth you know you now have. I think it's I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord and Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. So, you know, Paul, I mean, Peter knew he was going to die, you know, writing this letter. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. That was the point of this letter, to constantly just be a reminder so that these Christians could always remember. And, you know, it's like as I get older, I realize I can't remember anything. I forget everything. So now when somebody tells me something, the first thing I do, I take my phone and I set an alarm, you know, so I can remember. And that's what happens as we get older. You know, we start to forget. Chapter one, he issues a final challenge to the people of God to never stop growing in Jesus Christ. Never stop getting to know him as their personal Lord and Savior. In the following chapters, he gives two warnings about the corrupt teachers leading the Christians astray in the churches, one by their corrupt lives and through by their distorted theology. Throughout the letter, he is constantly fighting and debating these accusations that these false teachers are making during this time. All right? So the goal is to remind them so that they could be restored. He want to restore confidence back into the churches. Because what happened, these false teachers was going out from everything that they read from Paul, everything that they read from Peter, they, the false teachers were going out and undermining all of that. And the Christians, they were losing faith. So he wanted to restore that again. In chapter 1, he goes through the Christian life. It begins with faith in Jesus. It involves God's power and his promises. It deals with spiritual growth. Because with spiritual growth, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to have a vision. And you're going to have security. You know, if you're not growing in the word of God, you're not going to have stability. You know, you're not going to have a vision. You're not going to have the security. The best defense against false teaching is true living. It's not only hearing the word, but being doers of the word. He tells us, he tells us that men die, but the word lives on. It remains forever. It shines and it's spirit filled. To share in God's eternal life and love. That's what uh, Peter wanted to do in this letter. And by receiving this gift, you are now committed to develop the same character of God, which is goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, family affection, godliness. But the most important thing is love. That's what Peter wanted to establish in the heart of these Christians. And the apostates, they were coming and they were saying stuff like, nah, these, these apostles, they're making this stuff up. You know, they're conjuring this stuff up in their mind. And Jesus is not really coming back. That's what they were telling the Christians at the time. And Peter's rebuttal was, I was an eyewitness to this. You know, when you read in chapter 1, he, he talked about the, the, the mountain of transfiguration. He was like, I saw Jesus Christ transfigure. What are you telling me? He was like, I was an eyewitness account to this. And he saw Jesus as king. He saw Jesus die. He saw him resurrect. And he saw him ascend. And when you read in chapter 1, he's like, no, I'm giving you my eyewitness account. They saying something that I just came up with. No, I was actually there. I was the one of the few people that was there. In chapter two, he begins to warn them about false teachers. He describes them as deceptive, in denial, sensual, and greedy. And he says they are brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed. That's how he talks about these apostates. And in chapter two, they start to tell them that now nah, there's not going to be no final judgment. That's what they start telling these Christians. Like, you don't have to worry about it. There's not going to be no final judgment. And the true motive behind them saying that is because they wanted to live however they wanted to live. Against they were, they were sensual. They were greedy. They were full of lust. And at the end of the day, they didn't want a final judgment because they didn't want to meet their maker. They didn't want to be judged for how they were living. So this is why that was the motive of them going out there and preaching all of that. And at the end of second, uh, the second chapter, Peter describes them as a dog returning to their own vomit. He called them dogs. He called them pigs. He called them brute beasts. So now we get into chapter 3. Verse 1, he says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, right? That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before 
by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us and the apostles of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right. And, you know, he starts off by beloved, be mindful. That's how he addresses this church. He said he calls them beloved. And you think about just the chapter before how he described the false teachers, calling them dogs and pigs. He changes his tone here because now he's talking to the church and he's letting he's showing the church the heart of Christ and he calls them beloved. Right. And Peter believed that these were genuine Christians, that they had a pure mind. That means it was uncontaminated from the world, from the things of the world. He's like, you guys have been washed. You guys have been saved. Right. And just because you have a pure mind don't mean you have you don't have a bad memory. Right. So now these new converts, he understood they had to be taught and they had to be filled with the word of God. But the old the old Christians, he understood that they had to be reminded. And I know it's kind of hard, you know, if you've been saved five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. After a while, you start to get lax. You know, it's, it's not it's not you're not stirred up like how you used to be stirred up and you have to be reminded. And this is why we come to service every Sunday. Right. You know, at least once a week, we want to be reminded of the promises of God. Right. The only way Peter, Peter's readers could recognize the error, the errors of the false teachers was to compare their teaching with the teaching of the holy prophets and apostles. And it's like what they say about a counterfeit bill, right? For you to know a counterfeit, you got to know the real thing. So the more we know the word of God, when we hear something false, we're going to be able to spot it directly. And that's, that's always with me. You know, once I'm talking to somebody and they be like, yeah, 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 this is about the word of God. And I'm like, nah, that's not in the word of God. Why? Because I'm constantly in the word of God. You know, and that's why uh, Paul said the Bereans were more noble. Why? Because everything that Paul preached to them, they went and they sorted it out for themselves. Listen, guys, don't take nobody's word for anything when it comes to the word of God. You go and you search it yourself. Verse three, he says, <clears throat> he tells them to be mindful, right? In um, um, verse two, he tells them to be mindful. That's to be attentive and to be observant, you know, and that's and, you know, the, the way he describes it is to always be on guard because there's a lot of lies out there, you know, and now we have cell phones. You got the Internet. There's more there's more ways that lies can get to us now. So we have to always be on guard to not listen to everything, to not watch everything. You know, sometimes you could just get caught up and you're just sitting there and you're just watching something, watching something, but not understanding that the devil is always at work. He's always trying to deceive us. So, you know, he tells them to be mindful, be always on guard. Verse three, he says, knowing this, that the scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust. So he says, knowing this first, that means it's a priority. And he says, scoffers are going to come in the last days. When I see a scoffer, I know it's the last days. I don't get upset. When somebody come up to me and be like, ah, you a Christian? You still believe in Jesus Christ? I'm like, yeah, it's the last days. <laughs> I don't get upset when I see scoffers. You know, a lot of times we go out there, we're on the boardwalk, people are going and people are heckling you. That's just all, that's, that's all signs for the last days. That's all to stir us up, right? Spurgeon says, every time a blasphemer opens his mouth to deny the truth of revelation, he will help to confirm us in our conviction of the very truth which he denies. This entire age is marked by scoffers and saboteurs, right, of the Christian faith. And Peter's priority, again, is to warn these Christians, to remind them, right? Because that's the job of a false teacher, is to steal our hope. The word says that the, um, the enemy is, is here to still kill and destroy. That hope that you have in you of Jesus Christ returning, that's what the enemy wants to steal. And he'll, he'll, he's going to be relentless about it. So you, we always have to be on guard. He says that they're walking according to their own lusts, right? So you can tell a false teacher by why, by what? Their lifestyle. You know, they lust after power. They lust after money, sexual sin. You know, it says they mock the second coming of Jesus Christ because they want to pursue their own pleasures without consequence. Right. They don't want Jesus as Lord. When you see somebody has a beef with the Lord or has a beef with Christianity, it's not a, a problem of intellect. 
Don't believe that, that it's a problem of, oh, they don't understand the theology and it's a knowledge thing. No, it's always a moral thing. Like John 3.19 says what? Men love darkness. That's what it is. Our hearts are desperately wicked. So these false teachers, they're going to preach that, and people are going to believe that. Why? Because they want to be carried away by their own lusts and their own desires. Verse 4 says, and say, where is the promise of his coming? The early church believed that Jesus Christ would come back imminently, and scoffers played on the ridicule and the disappointment. Christians have been talking about Jesus Christ coming back for 2,000 years. I mean, this kind of hit close to home with me because I don't know if a lot of you know, but I used to be an Israelite, right? I used to be one of those guys on the corner in 1996 saying that Jesus Christ is going to come back before the year 2000. You know, I was 14 years old. And deep down inside, that's what I really believed that Jesus Christ was coming back before the year 2000. And in my mind, I was like, I got to get myself together before the return of Christ, right? And it didn't happen. 2000 came and went, right? It's 2020 now. I just thank God there was no Kool-Aid. You know, I didn't drink no Kool-Aid during that. But, um, you know, that's something that always been in my heart since I was 14 years old. You know, even though I was disappointed that Jesus Christ didn't come back before the year 2000, I remembered, you know, all my family and friends ridiculing me. Oh, you see, you, you believe that Jesus is coming back. Jesus ain't coming back. And now 20 years later, they're still looking at me like, you still waiting for Jesus Christ to come back? You know, and that's what these false teachers, that's what scoffers is going to play on. The disappointment that maybe you believe Jesus Christ was coming back in 2012 with Harold Camping, you know, or maybe in 2000 with the Israelites. Whatever it was, you know, that's what they're going to play on. Right. But again, scoffers are just the end of the just the signs of the end times. It's just to confirm me that, yeah, this is exactly what the word was talking about. It says, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they were from the beginning of creation. So, again, they're implying that God is absent from the affairs of men. They they taught that, you know, there's not going to be a great big judgment. That's just now how God works. Right. So why should we expect one in the future? Evolution has been stable since the beginning of time. They believe the universe was unchanging. So Christ's return is impossible. And it's just a quick application that the enemy will tell you because the Lord has not yet fulfilled the particular promise that he never will. That's a lie. You know, just because you're waiting on a promise from God and it didn't happen yet, that don't mean it's not going to happen. Remember, God always acts on the behalf of those who wait for him. So be patient and trust that everything the Lord has promised will, in his perfect time, come to fruition. Amen. Verse 5, it says, For this they willfully forget that that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water. Verse 6, it says, By which the word, which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. They willfully forget. Understand that they're going out. They, They know. Deep down inside, there's something in them that knows, but they'll willfully forget. And, they'll, and the thing is, they deliberately ignored two major previous events. The first one was creation, right? God stepped into the emptiness and brought the universe into existence in six literal days. It was, crea- it was not evolution, but creation. Understand that. The word used in Genesis is bara, which means God created something from nothing. And only God can do that. The active agent in creation was the word of God. He spoke it and it came into existence. That's it. Psalms 33 and 6 says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Hebrews 11 and 3 says, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It was by God's command that the world was made. Just by his word. Every time I think about that, it's just it amazes me. That he spoke everything into existence. And the earth standing out of water and in water, right? So when we read Genesis, it tells you that God separated the waters from the waters when you go through the book of Genesis, right? The second thing was the flood. The pre-flood world, 
It had a water canopy above the earth, right? And it was waters and reservoirs under the earth. And it sheltered us from ultraviolet rays. The climate was gentle without rain, storms, and snow. And it was like a greenhouse built in with a natural irrigation system. So, you know, when you read Genesis, it was like the water came from under the ground. And it, and it irrigated everything. And Adam, all he had to do was take care of that. Right? And by creating the water from above and below, God built in, like, the tools to destroy it. Right? And just understanding that, that's, that's just amazing. And the flood altered the original, the original created world order. Genesis 7-11, it says, The fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open." So the flood occurred like in two different directions, right? So you had the water from beneath, it burst it up, it broke up, and it and it kind of hit this canopy and the water came from above. So they were getting water from below and they were getting water from above during the flood. So you just think about the world just getting thrown into a washing machine and the cycle put on high. <laughs> Right? You ever just go to the wa- you ever see your washing machine, you're looking at your clothes and you're just seeing it going around? That's how the, that's exactly what happened in the flood. God just threw the world into the washing machine and he put the cycle on high. There are over 270 flood accounts from the Aztecs to the Mayans to all Eastern religions. They all recall about the flood of God. Right? So it's just not Christianity. If you go through different religions in different parts of the world, they all could recount a flood. Right. So the lesson here is the things on earth have not always continued the way they are now. Right. Therefore, no one should scoff at God's promises that he will make it different once again. This is a moral universe and sin will not go unpunished. That's how God moves. You know, he judges morally. Jesus himself used the flood to point out this. Matthew 24, 37, he says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So even Jesus Christ understood that, you know, God is watching the the time clock morally. Right. And the unchanging world, it changed radically when God is ready to invade our situation. He can recognize reality and bring the solution to your problem. Right. We're tired of living in this immoral world. Right. God has given us a new heart. He is he he is uh, renewing our minds daily. And we're tired of living in this world. Right. And that's the personal application. When God is ready, he sees the problem. He's going to intervene. Just like how he did in the days of Noah. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So he says, which are now, you know. So you think about the world before um, the flood. You know, people lived to 900 years. Now, after the flood, people are living to what? 100 years, if that, if that much. So the same way he intervened and he brought a new world with the flood, he's going to do it again. And this time it ain't going to be 100 years or 900 years. It's going to be forever. Right? It says preserved by the same word. The present world system is reserved for future judgment, which will come by the word of God. So the same way how he, he spoke creation into existence is the same way he's going to judge this world. He's going to speak everything into existence. The same word of God that created all matter and judged the world in the flood will one day bring judgment of fire upon the earth. It says reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So you think about the rainbow, right? The rainbow was given so the Lord said that he's never going to judge the earth again by water, right? In the future, God will destroy the heavens and the earth by fire. The present universe, the heavens are full of stars, comets, and asteroids. The core of the earth is filled with a flaming, boiling, liquid lake of fire. The temperature goes up to 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
right? The only thing that separates us from this lava mass is about 10 miles of rock. You never learned that in science class where they tell you, like, in the middle of the earth, there's this lava and this fire. And I remember being in science class, and I'm like, why is that there for? Until I started reading these scriptures this week. I was like, oh. The same way how the water canopy was above and the water canopy was below, the, the Lord, being sovereign, always understanding, he's like, yeah, one day I'm going to have to judge this earth by fire. So that lava that's separating us from 10 miles of rock is sitting there for the day of the Lord. And now you think about, you, you hear wars and rumors of wars, right? We're hearing about Russia, we're hearing about Ukraine. Everybody has atomic bombs, everybody has atomic missiles, right? So if we go to war again, it ain't going to be with swords and, and, and regular guns and all of that. Yeah, that'll be there, but we have more things to worry about, bigger things to worry about, right? Atomic bombs. So, under, so the Lord understanding from all of that that the world is going to be judged by fire, right? He says, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day, right? Again, he's approaching, you know, the way he's approaching the church is beloved, you know, it's soft. He's, it's like he's pleading with us, like, don't be ignorant of this one thing, right? That a day with the Lord is a thousand years. To God, one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. He's, he's outside of time. God is, is, is in eternity. Psalms 90 and 4 says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past. So you just think about a child, right? You know, anytime you tell a child to wait, 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 to them it feels like forever. They can't wait. You know, it could be five minutes. You're like, yo, just wait five minutes. They're grabbing, they're pulling, they're kicking, they're screaming. To them, they can't wait. That's how I think about us waiting for the return of Christ. The Lord is like, wait. And we're kicking and we're screaming and we're crying because to us, we don't understand time. You know, we're like children. We don't understand time when it comes to God. But, you know, God is, he's the great I am. There's no past, no present, or no future in him. He always was and is everywhere in space and time. God was, is, and always will be. And God often makes us wait not to frustrate us, but to deepen our trust in him. When it seems God's work is taking a long time, we should remember that God can do in one day what it would take humans a thousand years to do. Right? So when God, you know, when the day of the Lord comes back, trust me, we're just going to be standing afar and he's going to be doing everything. And just like how he created the world in six days, that's how fast everything is going to look to us. Verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not slack. That means the Lord is not late. He's not loitering. God is not in heaven kicking the can. Trust me. Long-suffering towards us. The truth is that God will keep his promise and without delay according to his timing. Any perceived delay from our perspective is due to the long-suffering of God who allows man as much time as possible to repent. There is a compassionate purpose in God's timing. The path to damnation is the path of a non-repentant heart. It is the path of one who rejects the person and provision of Jesus Christ and holds on to sin. Right? God is long-suffering. God is The reason why a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years and it feels like God is taking forever, because God is long-suffering. God is a merciful God. He's a loving God. He's a compassionate God. And that's why Peter is like, beloved, don't be ignorant of this. Don't be ignorant of the character of God, of who he is. Understand the reason why he's taking long to you is because he's compassionate. His will is that none should perish, right? Ezekiel 33 and 11 says, as, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. John 3.14 says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life. 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. That is the heart of God. That's why John 3.16 is the most famous scripture, because that is the true heart of God. God is compassionate. He's long-suffering. He's, he's sacrificial. This is the God we serve. And Peter just wanted to expose the ignorance of these scoffers. Not only were they ignorant of what God had done in the past, but they were also ignorant of what God was like. They were making God into their own image and ignoring the fact that God is eternal. Human beings are immortal, but they have, they have beginnings but no endings. They will live forever either in heaven or in hell. And this is why it's so imperative that we go out there and we preach the gospel. Right. That we show the people that, you know, this is the true heart of God. What did God say? How would people know that you're my disciples? By the way you treat one another, the way you love one another. It was through love, not condemnation, not through judging and putting down and being mean or whatever. It's always through love. That's how you show the heart of God, because that's who God is. God is love. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In which the heavens will pass away, and with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And you think about the day of the Lord. You know, I'm convinced that the day of the Lord is an extended period of time which opens with the tribulation, followed by the thousand year reign of Christ, the beef, the, the, the brief rebellion led by Satan, and the judgment of the great white throne. Right. The day of the Lord is this period of time. You know, that's when the day of man is going to end and the day of the Lord is going to be here. Man is running around doing whatever he wants. And God is long suffering because he knows he's he has to judge man. He has to judge the world and he wants everybody to repent. But when the day of the Lord comes, the day of man stops. Besides being a time of judgment, it will also be a time of salvation where God will deliver, deliver the remnant of Israel, right? And he will fulfill all those promises he did with the Israelites. The final outcome of the day of the Lord will be that the arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Isaiah 2.17 says, And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Right? And the word used to, about the dissolve is like a, a crackling, cackling sound, like a sizzling sound. You ever put bacon into a pan and it starts to sizzle? That's what it's going to sound like when the heavens start to roll up and the earth is being burned. Right? Verse 11, it says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So now Peter's application demonstrates a link between one, between what one believes and what one lives. What effects should these events have on believers? Since the things of this world, this world values are to be dissolved in this way, believers should stop focusing on worldly success and achievement. Right. So now Peter is like, since you know that all these things are coming, how are we living? You know, how, how should we live? And he says, holy conduct and godliness. Right. And when he uses the word manner, the translation for the word manner is like foreigners. It's like strangers. That's how we should be in this world. Right. God says that we're sojourners. We're just passing through. So when he says, what kind of manner should you be living in? It should be different, not odd. You know, you don't have to be odd. You don't have to be, you know, kind of strange, like in like off the world, off the wall. But you should be strange in the sense of how you're living. People should be seeing the love of Christ. People should be seeing the joy, the peace, the fruits of the spirit. You know, being different is attractive. You know, deep down inside, they might scoff, but they want that. They want the joy. They want the peace. I know a lot of times I'm, I'm at work. And things are going haywire, and they're like, yo, Mike, how could you be so calm? I'm like, I got the peace that surpasses all understanding. You're not going to understand it unless you're in the Lord. Because it's not that I don't see that there's trouble going on at the job, but, again, I have the peace of God. And deep down inside, you start to see, they start sparking up more and more conversations on the low. Why? Because you want some of that. I understand that. You know, and that's... And that's how we should be, right? We should be different in that sense where it's attractive. 
not being odd and kind of being pushy and judgmental, but it should always be with love and compassion, just like our Lord, right? So he says holy conduct and godliness, right? Holiness being set apart. First Peter 1, 5, 1, 15 says, but as he who called you holy, you also be holy in all conduct, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. We should portray godliness, and godliness is a life devoted to pleasing God. That's what people should see. That's what our friends and our families and our neighbors should always see, that we're being set apart, that we're abstaining from the things of the world, right? We're not lusting after the things of the world. That's what people should see. And then people should see us a constant devotion. They should know our schedule on Sunday like clockwork. They know every Sunday at a certain time that car is going to pull out. Why? Because it's going to church. Every Monday that car is going to pull out. Why? Because it's going to prayer meeting. You know, it's devoted to God. That's how they should see it. And this is a straightforward challenge for Christians to conform their lives to God's standards in light of the reality of the coming judgment and eternity, right? The coming of our Lord should push us towards sanctification. Understanding that Jesus Christ is coming back, right? Understanding that truth, it should sanctify us, right? It should have us wanting to live holy. It should have us wanting to be devoted to God. It should be purifying us. Understanding that reality that the Lord is going to come back and judge sin, right? So you want to be separated and set apart. Verse 12 says, looking for and, the, and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Looking forward, you know, always have that expectancy, right? Peter uses this uh, uh, verb, I think, three times between uh, verse 12 and 14. Recognize that God has a plan that it, affo- it unfolds just as he wants it to and that it, it cultivates in blessing for his people. What Christians look forward to is the, is the coming of the day of God. One of the motives of holy conduct and godliness is expectation. Hastening, that means eagerly desire, des- desiring, right? Like, I don't know about you, but I'm obsessed. I say it all the time. I'm obsessed with the return of Jesus Christ coming back. You know, I, I, I must say it three, four times in my mind every day. I'm obsessed with it to see that the Lord is coming back. And it might be kind of selfish because I'm saved already, you know, and I know that I have a hope. I know I have a future, but it is what it is. I want Jesus Christ to come back. I don't know about you guys, but I want Jesus Christ to come back, right? It says, since he is waiting for all who will come to repentance, the sooner believers bring others to the Savior, the sooner that day will dawn. Acts 3.19 says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. So, you know, when he used the the word hastening, it's like eagerly desiring, but also, you know, it's like, Somehow we're involved in Christ coming back sooner. You know, so he's like, go out there and preach the word. You know, I think in Romans it says that, um, you know, he's waiting for the time of the Gentiles to be fulfilled. Right. So he's waiting for all those who are part of his church. And once that number is filled, boom, rapture. So you don't know who it is. It could be that coworker. It could be that family. It could be that friend that the Lord is just sitting there waiting. Why? He said he will leave the 99 for one. That is his heart. He's not going to rapture all of us if there's one person that's left to be saved, that's supposed to be saved, right? So it kind of, you know, it's not pressure on us, but we're active in this. We're part of this. So that's why it's imperative that we just go out there and we preach the word of God. We don't know who, you know, who's holding this back, right? And whoever that is, just put pressure on them. Like, yo, you're holding this plan back, man. You know, Jesus Christ needs to come back. I'm ready. And you, you holding things up. Get your life together. Start to, that's, that's how you got to talk to people, right? So it says prayer also serves to hastening the day of the Lord, right? You think about Matthew 16, 6, 10, it says, what? Your kingdom come. You know, prayer. Going, uh, that constantly praying for the Lord to return. 
you know, he, he gives it into the Lord prayer. Oh, man, that's my alarm. Sorry. That's to let me know till I'm to wrap it up. <laughs> right. So you have the day of Christ, which is the rapture, the day of the Lord, which is the tribulation to the millennial and the day of God, which is the new heaven and the new earth. Right. So he talks about the day of God, and I believe the day of God is different from the day of the Lord. Like the day of the Lord is just this period of time where it's the tribulation. You know, um, you have the, uh, the, the, the millennial reign of Christ. But the day of God, I believe, is when the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth, and we're in eternity. Right. So that's the difference. Verse 13, it says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, which is where righteousness dwells. Right. And it says new in quality. So, again, where righteousness is going to be dwelling, it's not going to be no death, no sin, no sorrow, no crying, you know, to keep diligent for that. Right. So now he goes again at this last part. He says, beloved, be diligent. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace and without spot and blameless. Right. If our hearts are really set on the glory of the new heaven and the new earth, we will walk godly in peace and without spot and without bl- without being blameless. Right. Philippians four and says four and six says be anxious of nothing. So, again, without spot and without blameless, just like Jesus Christ. Right. He's the unblemished lamb. And that's how we, that's the kind of lives we're supposed to live. Right. Verse 15, it says, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destructions, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, right? So again, the Lord is long-suffering, right? And he's, he's basically saying that, you know, the things that Paul was teaching before, that uh, the false teachers, they were twisting, You know, that's what false prophets do. They twist the truth. They twist the word of God. Even Satan, when he came to Adam and Eve, what he did, he twisted the word of God. Right. So, you know, these things were hard to understand, but they wasn't impossible to understand. Right. And that's what they did. They saw that these new converts that uh, these new Christians that 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 were struggling with the word here and there, they started to twist them and 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 sway them away. Right. But he says that they do it. Why? Because they are untaught and unstable. Right. And they do it to their own destruction. Right. You take away anything from the word of God. You twist the word of God. You play with the word of God. It's to your own destruction. Right. So you're supposed to read the word of God and follow it exactly how it's meant to be followed. So, again, he he puts the pressure on them, not pressure on them, but, you know, he kind of stirred them up to be diligently to grow spiritually. Because, again, when you know the word of God, it's hard for somebody to come and sway you away. So verse 17, he says, you, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. There are four beloved statements, again, as I, I mentioned. Verse 1, it was, beloved, be mindful. Verse 8, beloved, be not ignorant. Verse 14, beloved, be diligent. And verse 17, beloved, beware. And he says, know this beforehand. Anytime a believer seriously listens to a false teacher, he runs the risk of being led astray. So again, beware, be constantly on guard. You know, guard your eyes, guard your ears, guard your heart, because there's so many lies out there. Right. It says, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. First Corinthians 10, 12 says, wherefore, let him that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. And you got to think about Peter. You know, Peter was a strong head guy. He was headstrong. And he was the same one that was like, Christ, I'm not like the rest of these guys. I'm going to I'll go. I'll be with you to the death. And as soon as the guards came, he was the first one to run. So Peter understood that, you know, be be steadfast, be, you know, you know, be guarded. Have have these things in your mind. Have the word of God, have the word of God in your heart and in your mind, lest you fall away also. 
The stability of Christians comes with faith in the word of God, his knowledge of that word, and his ability to use that word in practical everyday life, right? And the warning against breaking down the walls of separation that must stand between the believers and false teachers. You know, that's why he says being led away with the error of the wicked. There could be no communion with them. Apostates live in error while we live in the sphere of truth, right? How can we as believers maintain our steadfastness and avoid being among the unstable souls who are easily beguiled and led astray? And this is where we get to verse 18, the final verse. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Growing in the grace of God. Paul tells us in Ephesians, we are saved by grace. In 2 Timothy, he says we're strengthened by grace. He says, um, he tells us God's grace can enable us to endure suffering. His grace helps us to give, to give and to sing in difficult times. Our God is a God of, of all grace who gives to the humble. We are to be stewards of this grace. We are who we are by the grace of God. We must also grow in knowledge. How easy it is to grow in knowledge and not grace. All of us know f- far more of the Bible than we really live, right? Knowledge without Sorry. Knowledge without grace is te- is a terrible weapon. Knowledge without grace is a terrible weapon. They must be combined to reply to reply live the spirit-filled life. The better we know the word, the more we grow in grace and the word becomes clearer. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. When we are sanctified and growing in the grace and knowledge of God, it brings glory to God. Right? So, again, this this letter from Peter is to stir us up, is to warn us from the false teachings out there, the lies out there. But the main thing that I got, you know, again, he says, beloved. He uses that word so many times throughout this word, throughout this letter. And it just shows me the heart of Christ. Right. And again, Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen.